Today, after a period of one year, I once again have the opportunity to welcome all of our distinguished guests to this event. The National Peace Symposium is an annual event held at the Bet al Fatul Mosque, the largest mosque in Western Europe. It is one of the flagship events of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and this year marks not only the 10th annual peace conference, but also 100 years of the UK chapter of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. The symposium was initiated to promote a greater understanding of Islam and other faiths, and aims to unite people of all colour, creed and religion for one ultimate purpose, the promotion of peace in the world. The event is attended by over 800 guests and in the past 10 years it has been host to secretaries of state, parliamentarians, diplomats, faith and civic leaders as well as representatives from numerous charities and faith communities. I just want today, tonight, as your mayor, to thank you, thank everybody in the Mahdi community uh, for what you're doing to promote the things that made London shine out for my great-grandfather today. You are promoting this city as the world's greatest city of peace and understanding, and I congratulate you on that. One prominent feature of the Peace Conference is the awarding of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Peace Prize. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace was launched in 2009. It's an international award which recognizes the work carried out to advance the cause of peace. It is given to those who made a distinctive contribution to a speed without favor or prejudice. The prize was launched in 2009 by the spiritual head of the worldwide Ahmadiyya community, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Israel Aziz, and is awarded in recognition of an individual or organization's contribution for the advancement of the cause of peace. This prize is for SOS children and we accept this honour with immense gratitude. The money will be spent for our work worldwide, wherever the need is greatest. Thank you. Since its inception in 2003, the National Peace Symposium has brought together people. It has broken down barriers and united peoples of all colours, faiths and backgrounds together as one in the promotion of peace in the world. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community continues to hold functions such as the Peace Conference, not only here in the UK, but all over the world, continuing the community's example to foster interreligious peace and dialogue. We constantly raise our voice calling for peace in the world. And it is the pain and anguish we feel in our hearts that inspires us to try and alleviate the suffering of mankind and to make the world we live in a better place. Indeed, this very function is just one of our many efforts towards achieving this goal. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th National Peace Symposium of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK. We start tonight's proceedings with the recitation of the Holy Quran in Arabic by Imam of the Betul Fatu Mosque, Molana Naseem Bajwa, followed by the translation in English by Mr. Abdul Quddus Arif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
The verse recited before you is from chapter 4 of the Holy Quran, verse number 136. The English translation is as follows I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the ever merciful. O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witnesses for Allah, even though it be against yourselves or against parents and kindred. Whether he be rich or poor, Allah is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore, follow not low desires so that you may be able. Jazakallah. We have a packed program this evening and a number of guest speakers. And I'd just like to say if the audience wish to clap to express their appreciation after the speakers, they may wish to do so. I would first like to invite the National President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK, Mr. Rafiq Hayat, to give the opening address. Azu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Respected Hazur, Secretary of State at Davy, MPs, Your Excellencies. Worshipful Mayors, Lord, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. I'm delighted and honored to welcome you all this evening. In spite of the very cold weather, I'm very, very pleased that you were able to make it here tonight. 2013 is a very special year for us. Our Peace Symposium started in 2004 and with a humble beginning is now in its 10th year. The Bethel Fatou Mosque, which for all of us feels new, is now in its 10th year. And the UK branch of the Ambiya Muslim community is celebrating its centenary in 2013. In fact, the UK has a historic connection with the Ahmadiyya community. As some of you may be aware, that our community is the revival movement within Islam a movement that is now global and has tens and millions of members around the world. We are Muslims, but what distinguishes us is our acceptance of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad as the promised Messiah and the Imam Mahdi of the latter days. He founded our community in 1889 and revived the true spirit of Islam, rejecting violence and all manners of compulsion in the matters of faith. And he promoted humanity, humility, and the humble service of mankind based on a belief in a living God. 
The promised Messiah received a revelation, a part of which was that he saw that he was speaking from a pulpit in London, and he interpreted that to mean that whilst he may not visit England, his message would reach these shores and find a home in the hearts of the righteous. The promised Messiah's writing reached England during his lifetime. In fact, he wrote a special book on the occasion of the Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. But it was a few years later after his demise that the first spiritual leader, our Khalifa, sent the first Ahmadi missionary to the UK in 1913, thereby cementing the link between the community and the United Kingdom. The community bought a small piece of land in Southfields uh, <clears throat> that then became the home of our first mosque and indeed the first mosque in London called the London Mosque. As I mentioned, the community is led by a Khalifa. We are honored that since 1924, every Khalifa has visited the United Kingdom. And in fact, since 1984, the Khalifa has been based in London due to the persecution of our community in Pakistan. The present Khalifa, His Holiness, Hazrat Mizam Sur Ahmad, is the fifth successor of the promised Messiah, and he leads the global community in its endeavor to promote peace and to serve mankind. Throughout the past century, the UK community has been active in building bridges between communities and playing <clears throat> our role as an active citizen in the United Kingdom. As a part of the centenary celebrations, we will be giving thanks to God Almighty, for Britain is a true home that provides true religious freedom, and that is something that we must never take for granted. We'll also carry out blood drives to help save lives, plant 20,000 trees to protect the environment, feed 10,000 homeless people, and raise half a million pound for British charities to help in whatever small way we can. We will, do the, we will not do this just this year, but hope to do this every year. For that is our duty, our responsibility, and we will ensure that our youth, our elders, men and women alike, will help out so that we can all play a small part in this. Ladies and gentlemen, our community has been in Britain over two world wars, through three Olympics, through England winning the Cup in 1966, and we have been here through the challenges and the triumphs of the past 100 years. Hence, here we are with you, doing our best to serve our country, its people, and humanity at large. We have done this not to please you, but to please God Almighty, because this is what Islam, our faith, has taught us. For it is our belief that the love of God that has empowered, has, has the power to unite mankind and it is this journey we invite the whole of the world, for this is the pathway to peace. This is the focus of our Khalifa, His Holiness Hazrat Mizam Sur Ahmad, and <clears throat> through his numerous lectures in the past 12 months, including those delivered at Capitol Hill, the European Parliament, our Parliament, and through his letters to world leaders, both religion and political, he has continuously stressed the need for peace. His life has been a life of sacrifice and service and we are delighted that he's here with us tonight. I take this opportunity once again to welcome you all and to thank you for coming and joining us this evening. God bless you, thank you. Our first guest speaker tonight is Siobhan McDonough, the Member of Parliament for Mitcham and Morden a constituency she has represented since 1997, and it is the constituency in which this mosque stands. She currently serves on the Parliamentary Education Select Committee and is also chair of the all-party parliamentary group for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, a dedicated constituency, constituency MP and a wonderful friend of the community, Siobhan McDonough. Um, thank you, Fareed, for that very kind introduction. Let me say how pleased I am to be here with you today to celebrate the Amadean Association Centenary, an extraordinary achievement by most standards. And of course, it is a particular honour to be here today in the presence of His Holiness Hadrat Khalilfultul Masih. Asala, 
malay kum to you all. Um, in, the last, in, in the last several years, I've learned a great deal about Islam from your community. I have learned that Islam is built in, on the rights of life, equality, tolerance and justice. I have learned that Islam advocates the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. And more importantly, I have learned that Islam is a religion of peace. These are important values. They are values embedded in Islam, but they are also the bedrock of democracy. And these are the values that are integral to a peaceful and cohesive society. Since being elected Khalifa, I know that His Holiness has tirelessly set about promoting peace. You have launched the National Peace Symposium and set up an annual Ahmadiyya Peace Award, rewarding those who have shown an extraordinary commitment to the achievement of peace. You lead by example. More locally, I am extremely proud to hear about a group of Ahmadiyya Muslim youths who voluntarily cleaned the snow from the front of the hospital entrances and in the pathways of a local church in Croydon in January this year. Love of one na one's neighbour is surely the embodiment of peace, and once again, your community leads by example. I want to end with the words of a great man who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 and who fought tirelessly for equality and peace. Darkness, he said, cannot be driven out by darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King. Thank you once again for inviting me back here and thank you for taking the time to listen to this speech. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Hammond, MP. Stephen has been a Member of Parliament for Wimbledon since 2005. I should point out that being the largest mosque in Western Europe means that we actually fall into two constituencies, and as a result, Stephen is also our local MP. He was Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Communities Minister and is now a Minister of the Department for Transport, a good friend of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Stephen Hammond, MP. Assalamu alaikum. Your Holiness, Mr. National President, Your Excellencies, my Lords, Members of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Mr. National President stated, of course, that your community has been here for a hundred years, and I know that is in the next month His Holiness will have been caliph for ten years. And what a ten years that's been from the peace symposium that was imposed here ten years ago through the numbers, the numerous charitable and community events that you've taken part in in that 10 years, and the, numer and the numerous times that you have made these facilities available to the local community. I think in particular for those of us who are uh, from the Burton, the London Borough of Burton, you opened up this, uh, this space for us to be able to celebrate our Olympic community winners and to award those games, minister those games makers that came from this space. You're quite right, of course, that it, the, uh, the, there are numerous uh, events that have taken place in the last year uh, to which the community contributed. I'm particularly keen to say also that uh, on a more local level, those of you who know that uh, the message that you quite rightly uh, put out, your slogan, love for all, hatred for none, is even more, being, is even more effectively disseminated uh, at the moment as I see on so many cars as they drive round the constituencies and around London, the message, a message that rings out from your community, not only from your actions, but from your words as well. I'm grateful yet again to have been asked to speak at the Peace Symposium. I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to being here for many years to come. Thank you very much indeed. Our next distinguished speaker is Dr. Charles Tannock, MEP. Charles has been a member of the European Parliament for London since 1999.
He has a keen interest in foreign affairs and serves as a member of the EU Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee as well as its Subcommittee on Human Rights. He is also Chair of the European Parliament Friends of Ahmadiyya Muslims Group and hosted His Holiness's visit to the European Parliament in December. Charles is fluent in Portuguese, Spanish, French and Italian, but I believe he will speak in English tonight. Charles Tannock. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, your, uh, your Holiness, ambassadors, distinguished guests, fellow parliamentarians. This is a great occasion, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Ahmadiyya community in the United Kingdom, the 10th anniversary of the Peace Symposium. Uh, this is my second visit to your mosque, but I did have a, a, a remarkable opportunity to host two events in the European Parliament the last of which was in December of last year, when His Holiness uh, graced us with his presence in the European Parliament, when we launched and founded the Friends of the Ahmadiyya Community, and it was a very well attended and extremely successful event. And it raised the profile of the Ahmadiyya Community within the EU institutions. In fact, the President of the European Parliament himself, who is an extremely busy man, uh, actually uh, made time available to come and meet us all and meet His Holiness and understand the whole plight worldwide and the good work carried out by the Ahmadiyyas. I myself, as the Foreign Affairs Spokesman and Human Rights Spokesman of the Conservatives in the European Parliament, first became aware of the Ahmadiyyas, not just through my constituency basis, because of course this is still my constituency being part of London, but also because of my work uh, regarding religious freedom in the Muslim world, in particular in Pakistan, where I had taken an interest in the Christians, and I became aware of the Ahmadiyyas suffering the totally unacceptable ban on their religious right to freedom to practice their peaceful religion in the way that they wish to do so in Pakistan, and very much in contrast to what happened in Bangladesh, another country that I'm extremely close to, who actually have improved matters in, in recent years. I have often referred to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community as a model community that exhibits the values of loyalty, respect and peace, and I reiterate my belief that if others were as active and committed to peace, then I am sure that there will be much greater peace and stability in the world for all. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from Canada and has the distinct honour of being Canada's first ambassador for religious freedom, a post he took up just last month. The Canadian Prime Minister announced his appointment from the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community's Mosque in Toronto, and we are delighted that his first public speaking engagement in the UK is also at our mosque in the UK. He gained his doctorate from the University of Edinburgh and is a passionate advocate of human rights. Dr. Andrew Bennett. Wassalamu alaikum. Your Holiness, my Lords, members of Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous honour for me to be here tonight. I'd like to uh, thank His Holiness and members of the community here in the United Kingdom for this invitation. It's a great honour for me. At the February 19th event, when our office was announced, we emphasized that Canada would be a faithful friend of Ahmadiyya Muslims around the world. The goal of the Office of Religious Freedom and of my position as ambassador is about promoting and defending freedom of religion, freedom of belief around the world. The values of freedom, democracy, rule of law, and human rights which Canadians and people here in the United Kingdom also value so highly, will guide my work and the work of my colleagues. The foundation, the foundation of our work will be respect for inherent human dignity. This work is not about theological disputes. This is not a theological issue that we're about. It's about humanity. It's a human issue. Human dignity will be at the center of this work. We will be there and I will be there to speak out against religious persecution faced by Ahmadiyya Muslims in countries such as Pakistan. 
This week, I had the opportunity to be at a conference on religious freedom in Kazakhstan, in the capital, Astana. And I had the occasion to speak with Kazakhstani authorities about the condition faced by Ahmadiyya Muslims in that country, where they are not allowed to be officially registered as a faith community. And we will continue to speak out on that issue subsequently to that trip. Indeed, the Office of Religious Freedom in the Department of Foreign Affairs, International Trade and Development in Canada will be there consistently to speak out against the persecution of all people of faith, whether they be Coptic or Chaldean Christians in Egypt and Iraq, Baha'is in Iran, or Rohingya Muslims in Burma. This is truly challenging work. But with the support of people of goodwill, we can pursue the truth and achieve the good. And that good must be rooted in peace. And so I thank you again, Your Holiness, uh, for this wonderful honor. And I look forward to, I hope, working with many of you in the years to come, uh, our great allies here in the United Kingdom, to pursue this work. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also a long-standing friend and a distinguished parliamentarian, the Right Honourable Ed Davey MP, who is Member of Parliament for Kingston and Surbiton. He has served as Minister for Employment Relations, Consumer and Postal Affairs, and is now the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. He has held a wide range of portfolios pre previously, including the Treasury, Education, Trade and Industry, and Foreign Affairs. And we are delighted that he is with us tonight the Right Honourable Ed Davey, MP. Assalamu alaikum. Your Holiness, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be here again at your peace symposium. And I'd like to start by thanking and paying tribute to your Holiness for inviting us all and for holding your 10th peace symposium and showing the leadership that you do here in the UK and around the world to bring people together of all faiths and none to champion peace. You help everyone understand each other better and you teach us to look into our hearts to make sure love is in our hearts and that religious leadership you give on that message is very welcome and we thank you for it. Of course, this is the centenary year of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in the UK. And so we're celebrating that as well as your commitment to peace. And I have the honor to be hosting and organizing uh, the event in the House of Commons uh, later this year uh, to welcome you uh, and uh, on a cross-party basis to celebrate and to congratulate you and the community. I hope we can, I'm sure we will, be able to do that in peace between the parties in the House of Commons. Um, but as a Liberal Democrat here tonight, I have to remember uh, and to think of uh, Lord Eric Averby, who, who can't be with us tonight. He's been a long-standing uh, champion of the community, uh, and we uh, think of him uh, as he uh, uh, looks after his health. Whether it's coming to these symposiums, whether it's talking to many of my constituents who are um, Ahmadi Muslims, or whether it's going to the Jalsas, uh, those wonderful conventions uh, that you hold every year. I've learned the commitment of the Ahmadis and Your Holiness, not just about talking about peace and putting that message forward, but of doing things that are practical about it. Your work in making sure people can have clean water in many developing countries uh, is inspirational. Your commitment to bringing renewable energy to some of our poorest countries and communities is very admirable. And so I know that when I put the challenge to many people to make sure we are doing what we can to make sure climate change doesn't uh, bring conflict, that I know you will be at the forefront of, the, of that work. So, Your Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know we are all waiting to hear from Your Holiness and to be inspired by your words yet again. But thank you very much for this opportunity 
and thank you very much for your leadership. Tonight we have a number of distinguished guests who are with us. Time does not permit them all to speak, but I would like to recognise and acknowledge their attendance today, including uh, Lord Muhammad Sheikh, uh, Lady Sheikh, Councillor Ravi Govindia from Wandsworth Council, uh, Mayor Adrian Knowles, the Mayor of Wandsworth, the Mayor of Merton, the Mayor of Farnham, Rushmore and uh, Crawley, uh, Lord and Lady Singh, Henry Smith, Member of Parliament, His Excellencies, um, the Ambassador of Paraguay, the Ambassador of Lithuania, the Ambassador of Liberia, as well as Lord Tariq Ahmed and Lady Ahmed, Jane Ellison, Member of Parliament, Councillor Steve Lambr Lambritis, the leader of Merton Council, and His Excellency, the Ambassador of Liberia. Um, we're also joined by a Welsh Assembly Member, Mohammed Asker, as well as representatives from a number of countries, including Philippines, India, Mozambique, Colombia, and Brazil. We now come to the Peace Prize, and I request the National President to give the introduction to the winner of the Peace Prize. Thank you very much. The Amdiya Muslim Peace Prize for the Advancements of Peace was launched in 2009. It's an international award which recognizes the work carried out to advance the cause of peace. It's given to those who have made distinguished contribution towards peace without favor or prejudice. It gives me great pleasure to announce that the 2012 prize is being awarded to Dr. Boyochi Adiji for outstanding work in the promotion of peace. Throughout his life, life changing, through his life-changing medical work that he has provided hope and future for thousands of people. Dr. Boichi lives in America, but was born in Ghana, and is a renowned reconstructive spine surgeon and a founder of the Foundation of Orthopedics and Complex Spine, a non-profit making organization that has provided orthopedic and spine care to thousands of people in Africa and the Caribbean. With 100,000 pound of his own money, he established this charity and has led dozens of teams of surgeons and cl clinicians to Ghana and Barbados and other countries to perform orthopedic surgical procedures and to train local surgeons in orthopedic techniques. The charity also educates and better equips local healthcare providers to meet the orthopedic needs of their patients. All surgery is provided for free or at a nominal cost to cover hospital expenses. There is never a charge for physicians, services, offer any services or products provided by the organization. As a result, Dr. Boichi's work, many patients have regained their health and resumed gainful employment, and children have resumed academic and unrestricted recreational activities. We salute his work and are delighted to honor him. We will play a short video about his work, and then I'll request His Holiness to present Dr. Boichi Adiji the prize that consists of the trophy a certificate and a cheque of £10,000. It has been a lifelong goal of Dr. Ohenaba Boachi Ajay to make people stand straight, breathe better, and live a normal life. Dr. Boachi believes that complex spine surgeries could and should be provided in developing countries. Ghana is Dr. Bowachi's homeland and is one of the world's poorest nations. There is a significant lack of health care for Ghana's population of over 20 million. Life expectancy for a child born this year is just 61 and a half years. Many young adults here suffer from moderate to severe scoliosis caused by childhood infections like tuberculosis and polio. These viruses can penetrate the spinal vertebrae causing life-threatening curvatures of the spine that may constrict breathing. Left untreated, the spine can become deformed as the patient grows and develops. Because of this lack of health care, in 1998, Dr. Bowachi led the first team of focused medical volunteers to Ghana. 
using borrowed or rented space to perform their complex surgeries, the team soon realized that a dedicated space was desperately needed. The 50-bed dedicated facility provides comprehensive services that include ambulatory services, diagnostics, pharmacy, laundry, physiotherapy, outpatient consultation, and surgical care. The hospital features one state-of-the-art surgical suite with two operating rooms. It is the most advanced of its kind in West Africa. Assalamu alaikum, Your Holiness, Hadrat Mizra Masru, spiritual leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, excellencies, honorable ministers, distinguished honorees, guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply honored and humbled to receive this award for the advancement of peace, since I know there are many others as deserving as I. But I stand here on behalf of all the role models from my youth the early years in elementary and high school, and in later years, the academic, medical, and philanthropic disciplines, and the volunteers of the FOCUS organization. They have all inspired me and shared in my dream to give back to the poor, the crippled, and the disabled children and adults in Africa, particularly in Ghana. The over 500 FOCUS volunteers, mostly from my hospital, for the Hospital for, for Special Surgery in New York, have also come from all walks of life. We have had volunteers from the United States, Mexico, Argentina, Spain, Italy, Norway, India, New Zealand, Japan. To them all, I say big thank you. And above all, many thanks go to my family for their prayers, especially my dear wife, their support in standing me in all my decisions and activities over the years. We have together built our future from the jungles of Ghana to the bright lights and skyscrapers of New York to the freezing cold wintry snowstorms of Minnesota to the sunny west coast of California. But our hearts have always been home, Ghana, and we thank God for keeping us safe and on our feet. As a young first grader, I vividly remember the struggle for independence in Ghana when political opponents faced each other in my neighborhood in Kumasi, which compelled my family to seek refuge in our village. It's good to have a village. It was the longest day of my life as we journeyed on foot for six hours through pathways and narrow trails. I must say that it was the longest day of my life. As the UK chapter of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community marks its centenary anniversary, we are all reminded by the mission of His Holiness, Hadrat Mizra Ghulam Ahmad, to engender in people's hearts the love of God and the duty to save mankind. This is what FOCUS is doing in Ghana, a country of 25 million with only a dozen orthopedic surgeons. And the statistics is no better in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. You can imagine the need for help. And as I said during the opening ceremony of the FOCUS organization, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we should all pray to the Lord of the harvest to bring more laborers into the field. The struggle for independence is over, but we still continue in significant ways. Improvements are needed in education, health, nutrition, a culture of tolerance, and peaceful coexistence. This is where our governments and all concerned citizens 
can play a major and critical role. I personally learned of giving back early in life when I witnessed firsthand a pediatrician who, after training abroad in the UK, returned to my hometown in Ghana to care for the sick children. I was one of the sickest at the mercy of traditional healers who had no clue how to diagnose my illness and lacked the ability to prescribe remedy for my ailing body. But I'm alive today, thank God, because one UK-trained Ghanaian pediatrician decided to come back home to set up medical practice in my hometown. It was not how much money he made taking care of the sick kids like myself, but I'm certainly sure he derived gratification, saving our lives and giving children new leases on life. He was happy that we were happy. And the greatest philosopher, Aristotle, said, happiness is in the participation of something that brings fulfillment, and fulfillment is found in helping and serving others. And the Nobel laureate, Abbe Schweizer, who established a hospital in Gabon, believed that service is our destiny, and said that the only ones among us who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. We hope the Focus Orthopedic Hospital in Ghana will provide the needed orthopedic care for all who come to us, as well as educate and train the local professionals and develop the orthopedic workforce for the future, not only in Ghana, but in Africa and beyond. We all need to remember our roots and give back. I'd like to thank the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission, the board for selecting me for this award, and I wish everyone here and the nations of the world peace and prosperity. God bless you all and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. I should have also earlier acknowledged His Excellency, the High Commissioner of Sierra Leone, who's with us as well. We now come to the keynote address of this evening by His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the head of the worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim community. All distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <clears throat> I would firstly like to thank all of you, our respected guests, for accepting our invitation to attend today's Peace Symposium. All of you, whether attending for the first time or if you are our old friends are very welcome. <clears throat> we are truly grateful that you have enlightened this event with your presence. The majority of you are non-Muslims, and so I particularly appreciate your gesture in coming, considering that you are all aware that the Ahmadiyya community is an Islamic sect. Generally speaking, attending the function of another group, irrespective of religious differences, is not rare or all that significant. We often find people who, despite differences of belief, are able to develop very close friendships with one another due to their open hearts and broad-mindedness. 
Nonetheless, there are a number of reasons why your attendance is particularly praiseworthy and significant. Firstly, the very fact that you have accepted the invitation of a Muslim group is significant. Secondly, the fact that you are willingly attending a function taking place within the complex of a mosque is noteworthy. And thirdly, the acts of certain so-called Muslims have led a fears or reservations developing in the hearts of many non-Muslims. Bearing all of this in mind, we extremely appreciate that you have taken this kind and considerate step. Our old non-Ahmadi friends are well aware that the Ahmadiyya community practices exactly what it preaches and that whatever we say and do is based on true Islamic teachings, which are of love for all, hatred for none. However, as I have said, we also have some new friends in attendance today, and it is quite possible that they may harbor some doubts or suspicions about us or about Islam. And so I would like to reassure them from the outset, the truth is, is they will hardly find anyone or any group who is more opposed to cruelty, extremism, and injustice as we Ahmadi Muslims are. To establish the highest standards of love, affection, and brotherhood are our objectives. With these words of introduction, I now turn towards the main theme of tonight's event. Each year, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in the United Kingdom organizes this function as a means to express and show the people of the world that we desire and strive for a world filled with peace. In order to attain this wonderful objective, we also acquire your help and support. Thus, today, we have joined together to remind ourselves about the importance of this aim. To strive for peace is a noble ambition and is something that the world has always stood in great need of. If we look at the situation of the world today, we realize that now, more than ever, it is a pressing and urgent need of the time for us to seek and pursue peace and harmony in the world. During the past four or five years, the various uh, disasters and forms of unrest have, that have uh, occurred or are occurring have led directly to an increase in restlessness and disorder. There is no doubt that with each day that passes, the peace of the world is ebbing away. We cannot attribute the world's lack of peace on just one or two factors. In fact, there are multiple reasons which are all contributing the increasing disorder. I shall name just a few. The world's economic crisis has contributed hugely to global unrest and increased frustrations amongst the masses. Another major cause of division is internal power struggles within countries. And then, in many nations, the rights due to members of the public 
are being unjustly usurped. Another factor is that some parties seek to demonstrate their power and might by treating others extremely cruelly. Further, a root cause of division is a lack of justice in the world. This is leading directly to a complete lack of mutual confidence and trust. Another cause of unrest is the fact that people or governments look at the wealth and resources of others with a sense of, sense of envy and greed. In fact, they do not limit themselves to the envious classes, but actually seek to seize what is not rightly, uh, rightfully theirs. As I said, there's a long list of reasons by the world uh, why the world is being consumed by hatred and disorder. And I have only mentioned a few. These issues are of grave concern, and we must reflect over how to solve them so we can seek to establish global peace. Enmities and differences are increasing daily and are rapidly spiraling out of control. The, the state of the world is going from bad to worse. Something which has been said in the past, which is very true, is that whilst it is extremely difficult to make a good friend, it is very easy to make an enemy. If we look at the world today, we find that from the very smallest scale of society to a national and international level, these are the circumstances that are prevalent. Not only do people espouse hatred and carry out evil acts, but they are also inciting others towards such cruelties and oppression. On the one hand, the numbers of those who are causing conflicts is ever increasing, whilst on the other hand, the numbers of people who are actually acting with justice, good morals, and trying to bring about reconciliation is ever decreasing. With this backdrop, I say again that the Ahmadiyya community remains constantly engaged in striving for better society, and so today's event is also being conducted in an effort to promote true and long-lasting peace. For the past five or six years, I have warned all of those within my reach about the deteriorating state of the world. I have repeatedly said that the worsening financial and political climate is leading the world towards the most horrific destruction. It is quite possible and even likely that the path the world is treading will culminate in a terrifying world war. <clears throat> More than 65 years have passed since the last world war. And I fear that people have forgotten the unparalleled levels of devastation and destruction that it caused. In that global war, more than 70 million people were killed, the majority of whom were innocent people who were dragged into the war unwillingly. Just a few months after last year's peace symposium, I traveled to the United States and was invited to address members of Congress at Capitol Hill. Apart from the politicians, a number of important think tanks and academics were also in attendance. In my address to them, I said that as the world's biggest superpower, the United States had to consider its responsibilities to the wider world. I said that if they fail to fulfill their obligations,
And if they fail to observe the proper standards of justice, then the, they would lead the world towards a terrifying destruction. I said that the coming generations would lay the blame at the feet of us, and in particular, the major powers of this time. Our children or grandchildren would not forgive us because they would know that we could have prevented the harrowing legacy that we left behind for them. Similarly, last December, at the European Parliament in uh, Brussels, our good friend who has just spoken as well, Dr. Charles Tanek, MEP, organized an event in which I was able to address members of the European Parliament. Also in attendance were MPs from various national parliaments and a range of other dignitaries and influential people. I took the opportunity to remind the European countries of their responsibilities as member nations of the European Union. I have delivered the same message, calling for peace and justice. On many occasions in different parts of the world, I do the same. I do not know how much impact my views have had on those who have listened to me. And I am not aware to what extent they are working towards developing peace within their own circles of influence. Nevertheless, I will, God willing, always continue to carry out my task and my responsibilities of promoting peace, tolerance, justice, and compassion to the corners of the world. I will continue to tell all people that in order to be relieved of the pain and suffering that we face today, we must adopt true justice and equality. What is actually meant by justice and what does it require? I shall now answer this question based entirely on the teachings of the Holy Quran. The Quran teaches us that all people must display absolute justice and bear witness in the name of Allah. Even if they are forced to give evidence against themselves, their parents, or their loved ones. Further, the Quran teaches that a person must not lead, uh, must not let the enmity or hatred of any nation incite them to act unjustly. Rather, they should always act in a fair and equitable manner because that is the standard required by our loving God. In order to develop peace, it is necessary that we first establish these standards of justice. However, when we analyze today's world, we find that such moral standards are not being implemented anywhere at any level. Indeed, it is with great uh, with regret that I have to admit such standards of fairness have been long forgotten even by the vast majority of Muslims to whom these teachings were given. We neither find these standards of justice between people in society nor in terms of the relationship between the general public and their governments. Similarly, such high standards are not visible in international relations. It would prove extremely difficult to find even one person who is willing to give evidence against himself or his loved ones in order to uphold the true requirements of truth and justice. In the same way, it would be almost impossible to find a country that acts entirely fairly with another nation with whom it is in dispute or considers to be an enemy. Keeping all of this in mind, if we want true peace and if we want to save the world from destruction, then we must act with justice, integrity, 
and be ever faithful to the truth. If we want our children and future generations to look back at us fondly rather than with anger that we left them disabled and handicapped, we must act in, uh, in accordance with the standards of equity I have sp spoken of. If we fail to do so, then there will be nowhere left to hide and no escape from destruction. Uh, destruction. I purposely use the word disabled. In terms of the legacy we leave to our future generations, this is because it is extremely likely that, that if a world war takes place, nuclear weapons will be used. The effects of atomic warfare are beyond our imaginations and will last for generations to come. Therefore, the standards of justice I have described needs to be implemented across the board, not just by Muslims, but also by non-Muslims and all nations. No one will be spared the effects of a nuclear war will be devastating because its path of destruction will be impossible to contain. The people of the East and the people of the West will be affected. Whilst it is true that current indications suggest that a world war is likely to ignite from Asia. The truth is that the West will be, not be able to stay away from it. The, to illustrate this point, we should look at the escalating conflict between North and South Korea. Their relations are fast deteriorating, but even though it lies thousands of miles away, the United States has become directly involved. North Korea has threatened not just South Korea, but also America. North Korea is known to have nuclear weapons and has not been shy in threatening to use them. It appears that North Korea does not really care about or understand the consequences of its actions and is trigger happy. This is why just last week the United States announced it was strengthening its missile defense system on its west coast. All, <clears throat> all major parties, including Russia and China, have recently condemned North Korea. Although the long-term views of these two countries are not entirely clear. Another example of conflict is, is visible if we look at the relations between China and Japan. Over the past few months, a dispute over who owns a series of highlands in the East China Sea has intensified. Again, we cannot say that this dispute will be limited to the two countries. Rather, it is quite possible that America will become involved in this conflict as well. Whilst the United States has publicly called on both countries to show patience and restraint, its real symp uh, sympathies lie uh, with Japan. The America-Japan alliance is such that if a war between China and Japan were to take place, the United States would actively side with Japan. Today, a major tactic used to try and harm enemy nations is to target their trade and business interests. The world today is not the same world it was 50 or 60 years ago. Even back then, the acts of one nation's, uh, nation affected others. However, 
Today it is at a completely different level. As the world has become extremely closely knit and interdependent, China is emerging as an ever-growing progressive economic might and is expect, uh, expected to become the largest in the coming years. Its economic might is so strong that commentators have said that its power is causing great concern to the United States. Indeed, it is being rightly said that the United States will seek to halt China's economic progress and will leave no stone unturned in this effort. Given this, it is possible that China will be somewhat cautious and show restraint in its dispute with Japan, but there are no guarantees to this. Sometimes, when weaker parties are threatened or cornered, there often comes a time when they see no route of escape other than through aggression, and so they become even more dangerous. Perhaps because of foreseeing and considering uh, America's attitude and policy and its ultimate possible effect on other Western countries, China has started exploring new markets. As in recent years, we see that China has invested a great deal in Africa and the developing countries. So its economic interests in that part of the world are widespread and deeply ingrained. As a side note, I should also say that if African countries realize their importance, it is quite possible then that in the event of a war between Western and Asian uh, countries, Africa could become a place of safety and refuge. In short, the dangers faced by today's world are extremely alarming. We must always remember that a tense state, tense state of affairs has the potential to very suddenly explode or inflame. Small and seemingly insignificant matters, if not handled delicately, ultimately prove to be the basis for extremely dangerous results. History bears witness to this, and certainly this is what we have seen in the First and Second World Wars. In the same way, today, the desperate state of affairs in Syria also seems to be leading us down a path towards something far wider and even more devastating. It apparently remains a war between government forces and opposition rebels. Yet, we are fast approaching a death toll of 100,000 people. A number of powerful countries think that if the opposition rebels proved victorious, and were able to form a government, then the situation in Syria would suddenly stabilize. They believe that the conditions of the Syrians and the relations between the Syrian government and the international community would improve. However, if we look at the recent examples of Libya and Egypt after their so-called revolutions, we should realize that the situation would not necessarily improve. <clears throat> a sign of this was witnessed already earlier this month when a group of Filipinos were, who were posted as uh, United Nations peacekeepers were taken hostage by a Syrian rebel group. Further, the rebels say they do not need peacekeepers or food aid. Rather, they want weaponry such as anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles. Such acts and statements do not inspire confidence that long-lasting peace is their objective. 
So what should be done in Syria if the world sees that cruelty and oppression is continuing to take place and the desperate Syrian people are carrying out for help, uh, crying out for help, then the neighboring countries should unite together in order to stop the cruelty and establish peace. They should not seek to fulfill personal or vested interests, but their goal should only be the peace and prosperity of the local people. The Holy Quran teaches that when cruelty has been successfully stopped and the aggressor pledges and adopts peace, then undue restrictions should not be enforced as a means to express power and might. Although this key principle particularly applies where one country attacks another, it can actually be applied to all situations in order to establish peace. Recently, a wise suggestion was made by the Israeli President Shimon Perez about how to deal with the situation in Syria. He suggested that rather than Western countries intervening to remove the government, the United Nations should send a peacekeeping force to Syria consisting of only Arab soldiers. So it does not appear to be a Western invasion or imperialism. He further said that as the Arab League is a local organization that already exists, it should use its influence to try and establish just and fair government in Syria. The Holy Prophet Muhammad said that wherever a person finds words of wisdom or good advice, they should adopt them and should not look to see who has given the wise counsel. Therefore, regardless of the fact that it is the suggestion of the President of, of Israel, the Muslim countries should pay close attention to this proposal. Unfortunately, Syria is not just a single issue in itself to solve. But a major obstacle in the pursuit of peace is that within Arab nations, there is little or no justice. When they do not treat their own citizen fairly, how can they seek to bring justice in other countries? This leads to the conclusion that the entire world is confronted by division and stands on the brink of disaster. No parties will be spared if the situation gets any worse. Eastern countries that have Western support or Western governments themselves will have to bear the effects of the increasingly destructive straight, uh, state of the world. The end result is likely to be a horrific and destructive war. I say once again that such a war will more than likely include the use of non-conventional weapons, meaning nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Amongst all of this, there is only one hope and one guarantee of peace, and that is for justice to prevail in the same spirit that the Holy Prophet وسلم, has taught, that you prefer for others what you prefer for yourself. If such justice can develop where, where each country and each great power prefer for others what it prefers for itself, then we can still find peace. It requires all parties to give truthful and fair testimony and rather than uh, veto power for a select few. There should be true democracy and justice across the board. If these steps are taken, then we will find peace between nations and we will find that terrorist organizations will die away and lose all support. Until recently, the main terrorist groups 
were based in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but in the past few years, we have seen that they have also emerged in some African countries and elsewhere. But if true peace through justice prevails, then certainly the members of the general public will stand up and forcefully reject extremism, and so terrorist organizations will die away. It is a tragic irony that so-called Muslim terrorist groups are defaming Islam by justifying their hate-filled activities in the name of the religion. The truth is that their Islam has nothing to do with the real Islam. The true Islam is a religion of peace that has enlightened the world with its beauty and purity. As I said before, there are multiple causes of why the world stands on the brink of disaster and the rise of terrorism. The rise of terrorism is uh, one cause. The threat of the world war is the biggest threat to today's civilization. It is a real threat. And to prevent such an outcome, we will have to think in a fair and just way so that we can save the world from ruin. It is noteworthy that the one of the biggest causes of today's lack of peace is the current financial circumstances of the world, which have become extremely strained over the past few years. In a very recent interview, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg said that today's economic climate was the same as was faced by the world prior to the First World War. He added that the desperate financial circumstances at that time were a major cause of the war. Whether others agree with him or not, in my view, his analysis is correct. Indeed, I would go further to say uh, that today's world situation is also very similar to that which prevailed in the years preceding the Second World War. The words of warning given by Luxembourg's Prime Minister are something that we should consider very seriously and pay urgent attention to. The Prime Minister said, anyone who believes that the eternal issue of war and peace in Europe has been permanently laid to rest would be making a monumental error. And so we should not sit here and only be concerned at the prospect of becoming involved in wars that are taking place in Asia, but we should also be extremely concerned about the problems on our own doorsteps. If we look at Europe's own financial crisis and its long-term effects, we see that it is causing restlessness to spread within Europe's population. And this anxiety is increasing at great speed. If not handled properly, the results of such frustrations and dis desperation will prove to be catastrophic. Thus, it is the duty of all powers to fulfill the requirements of justice and to unite together. All parties need to increase dialogue and open the lines of communication so that they can peacefully discuss the best means to solve the problems of the world. These steps are necessary so that global peace can be established. It is my prayer that Allah grants the people of the world the ability to do this. Before con concluding, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to offer my heartfelt congratulations to Dr. Bwache Ajay, the winner of this year's Ahmadiyya Muslim Peace Prize. I was very pleased to hear of all of his services to humanity. With these words, I would also like to thank all of the guests once again for taking the time and effort 
to join us today. I hope and pray that you have enjoyed and benefited from this event. May Allah bless you all. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness will now lead us in silent prayer before food. We pray by raising our hands. You may join us in any manner you feel comfortable. Amen. After the meal, many of the guests attending the conference had the opportunity to speak to Hazur Akdas. The event was attended by several hundred guests, including ambassadors, special dignitaries, members of parliament, representatives from charities and faith communities. His Holiness has a huge breadth of knowledge about, obviously, the Amadea community, about what is going on internationally. I just saw him uh, talk to um, a representative from the Canadian government, and he seemed on top of what was happening in Canada, in all sorts of countries, talking about the faith in uh, Africa. So he's a man of great knowledge. Well, I think His Holiness and the Amadea community uh, are expressing the core of their faith uh, in uh, being active in promoting the cause of peace. Uh, love for all, hatred for none is one of the key teachings uh, of the Ahmadiyya uh, community. Uh, and I think sharing that with uh, everyone here in the UK, but also with all the people invited, whether it's politicians like myself, or whether it's community leaders or other faiths, or ambassadors from countries around the world, I think that is important, that we're engaging, discussing uh, the issue of peace and how we can all now, different ways, play a part in uh, making sure that we have peace in our world. It's an extraordinary cross-section of people who are brought together here of all faiths, of lots of parts of civic society and you know I think that to be honest any organization just getting that many people together exchanging views getting to know each other that's a good thing in itself. Well the, the, the His Holiness's speech uh, depicted a pretty somber world and I think that's a wake-up call for, for all of us about the challenges to international peace and security and the economic challenges the world is facing. Hazul then proceeded to the exhibition hall at Beit al where he met with representatives from Britain's armed forces and academics. Uh -huh. Hello, please. Good evening. Have it. How is everybody? This included Commander Eugene Morgan, Commanding Officer of HMS President, Captain Doug Spencer from the Royal Marines and Professor Malcolm Giles, Vice-Chancellor of the London Met University. Following this, Hazul met with human rights activists and reporters from the English media. This included journalists from the Daily Telegraph, Independent and the BBC. 
The final group of people to meet with Hazur were senior members of the Pakistani community in the United Kingdom and representatives of the Urdu press. I was talking about what Surat Nisa says about, about inheritance of properties, about forced marriages, about rape should not be... The event and in particular the keynote address by Hazrat Amirul Mu'mineen Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Israh Laziz was well received by many of the guests. I think it was a marvellous gathering. One thing I noticed about the gathering tonight is that there were a number of non-Muslims there. There were Christians, there were Jews, there were some Sikhs as well. So I think a gathering like this is very desirable because by coming here, they begin to understand the true message of Islam. I thought His Holiness uh, really touched on so many different aspects in geopolitics. Um, and his analysis, uh, I think, showed a great depth of uh, wisdom and an awareness of uh, various situations. Um, so I was, I was really uh, appreciative of his words and sort of what he had to say. I understand the different parts of Islam, and I think what I've come to understand today is um, the peaceful side, and I think that's what I'm going to take away, the lovely, friendly atmosphere and the feeling of peace and love to everybody. We can only see a peaceful world if we see a just world as well and therefore I do think it's incumbent upon all religious leaders uh, to uh, remember the core of what their faith is telling them and that should be about peace, that should be about social justice, uh, that should be about doing what is right uh, in the eyes of God. What makes me come to see all of you is the message of peace, the message of brotherhood, the message of affection among people, among different cultures, different races, different creeds. We can all live together in peace.